I'm Julian. Uh, uh, in the Chinese historical corpus, we have a lot of rhymed uh, material uh, that spans like very long uh, time. So Shi Jing, Shu Zi, Zhang Jiepian, like we've seen the bronzes, uh, the mirrors, etc. And um, as Ash has mentioned, we have like these hundreds of thousands of poems and millions of lines and uh, these can be used as a source of historical pronunciation information, um, or you know you can study it for other things. You want to study stylistics of poetry, that's also possible. Uh, but here we're interested in if we annotated it, we could analyze phonological change, perhaps. Um, corpus is too big to annotate, uh, and so in the previous article I presented the method to try to. Like read, you read a lot of poetry, and from reading a lot of poetry without knowing the pronunciation, you infer what rhymes with each other. Um, so at first you imagine everything might be rhyming, and then because there are some characters you never see together, you conclude then they probably don't rhyme uh, with each other. And with this, you can uh, annotate like two, 250,000 poems. So I published a the annotated uh, Quan Tang Shi and uh, Quan Song uh, Quan Song Shi. Yeah, I didn't do the no, not that. Uh, I did the Shi because that's easier. Um, and then there's a kind of question of like, what's the quality of these automatic annotation? Because you know you can add, uh, automatically annotate things and make it rubbish. Um, and so in the article, there's like some examples. Sorry, I will have to move. Uh, you have example of poems that are like not just a a a a, where the annotator detected correctly that you know it rhymes like a a b b c c etc. Uh, I I don't know if you can read, uh, but it goes like nip keep uh, one ten. Well, this one rhymes uh, somehow. Uh, yin yin and then zhong yong xiu hu. Okay, and. In the same article, like I also present uh, cases where, well, it's clear that, uh, so here my annotator produces a B on the Xia, and we see, you know, like maybe in Mandarin, we can kind of see, you know, like we have Huai, uh, this one, I'm not sure what it's pronounced actually, uh, but I'm going to guess it's pronounced something I, uh, and then Xia and Pai, sorry. Hi, okay. So we have I, I, A, and I. So in Mandarin doesn't rhyme. And it seems my annotator also considered it didn't rhyme, but in late Middle Chinese, these were all I, I, I. So Xia uh, was from Sir Kiai, if you follow uh, Pulley Blank. So, all right, the article kind of gives a few examples of hey, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and overall it seems to be working, but uh, can we measure the quality of this? And so, most of my presentation today is. Right, how do we measure if it's good or not? Because there's 250,000 poems. Uh, so we need a metric. Uh, my citation uh, style is not very good here, but um, essentially there's some literature on metrics for rhyming. Uh, there's uh, these people, Haider and uh, Kuhn, um, who have a metric where they, they check, their metric is on the accuracy of saying whether two words rhyme, but not in the context of annotating poems. So they just say, in the abstract, if you take these two words, could they be used for rhyming? And I am more interested in seeing, do these two words rhyme in a specific poem? Because two words might rhyme in a poem, and then at a later time, not rhyme. So this is the kind of context I'm interested in. Um, and the other paper from which I'm going to base a lot of uh, the further discussion um, is published by uh, Mattis List, Nathan, and uh, Chris, uh, who are here, um, where there's this entire idea of like the standardization of uh, how you annotate poems. And towards the end of that paper, there's a proposal to use what I called uh, B cubed metrics. I'll introduce what it means uh, just after. And, and then they use it to kind of say, Baxter and Wang uh, for the annotation of the Shizing are very close. I think they cite like 97% uh, agreement between them. Um, and right, so uh, the idea is I'm going to present what B cube metrics are, um, what are its properties, and like its unfortunate disadvantages, 
and why I choose to use another thing. So I realized that these notes might be difficult to read, so I'm sorry, but now you know what uh, graphs and notes are, hopefully from the previous presentations. So here we have a, we have a poem, uh, that's the poem I've just shown before, where my annotator gives a B on the ya, uh, and the ground truth is me going by hand and saying, no, actually, I think this poem is A, 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 A. And here we see a representation of the ground truth on the left, so four characters that are all linked to each other. And on the right, this is what my annotator produces. So it says, Kwai, uh, Hai, and Pai like rhyme together, they're linked, and Tia is alone uh, on the side, if that makes sense. Yeah, is it okay so far? Yeah. Um, all right. So, B cube metrics, the idea is that we say, uh, maybe I can use the pointer. Um, the thing on the left is the truth, the, the thing on the right is what we evaluate. And we compute uh, two things that are called recall and precision. The idea is we say, for instance, we take the character Y, we look at the cluster. So when you have several nodes uh, linked together, that's called a cluster. You take this cluster there, and then you compare with the cluster in which Y is on the left. You take the intersection. So that would be this triangle there. And in recall, you say, did we get all of the, of the nodes uh, and here we didn't get all the nodes. So we say here we have a cluster of four characters, while here we have a cluster of three characters. So for the character Y, we only identified 75% of the things that rhyme with it. Uh, and for the character Tia, we say, okay, so we have a, a cluster of one here, while Tia here is in a cluster of four. So we only got one quarter of the nodes that are supposed to be in the cluster. So now we have we average over all the nodes. So we have three nodes there where we have three quarter identified and one node where we have a quarter. And that gives us this number. So the recall uh, that kind of tells us of the things that rhyme, how many have we found uh, is 0 0.625. Uh, and then we have the kind of reverse metric, which is precision. And the intuition behind precision is to say, when I said that two things rhyme, how often was I correct? And here, here, uh, when my algorithm said two things rhyme, they were 100% correct for this poem. Because here I said, Tia rhymes with Tia, that is correct. Uh, and then these three rhyme together, that is also correct. So precision is one. And then we derive a metric that's called F1. So in a mathematical term, that's called a harmonic mean. So you do two times uh, precision multiplied by recall divided by precision plus recall, and you get this score that's 0 0.769. So this is how uh, B cube metrics uh, work. And yeah, that's the basic principle on like a simple, like a four line poems. Um, and now there's the question of, okay, let's take, uh, this is the third poem of the Shi Jing, and this is the second stanza specifically of the, so the Tuan R. And we see the annotation um, by Baxter in like his uh, 92 book. And Wang Li, uh, well, I cite uh, 2014 because that's the edition I found his collected works, but uh, I imagine that's his book from the eighties. And so we can see that they basically agree, like this is a poem that rhymes AAA. So I forgot what the characters are, but I'm going to just read them in like the Wangli pronunciation and uh, reconstruction where it says like that's Mwai, Dwai, Luai, Hui. But on top of this, Baxter also says, well, there's these characters there that are like not in final position that also do rhyme. And well, I don't have a great intuition for this, but like if you look at their uh, at their Mandarin pronunciation, perhaps like you know you would say, well, that rhyme. That's like tui wei, and then hui tui, uh, and then we have, we have like lei, and then well, kui just happens to rhyme uh, in all Chinese. So Wang Li and Baxter gave a different annotation uh, of this poem. And this is the Baxter graph. So we have six characters that rhyme all together. So we have links between everything. 
and we have Wang Li, who has four characters only writing. So now, based on this, we can't really compute the, the B cube metric I was telling you before, because if I say, OK, let's take this character, the uh, what is this one, Sui, no, Hui, um, and I say, let's compute the recall or the precision for this one, well, it's not present in that graph. So can't compute. Um, a simple solution is to say, right, for every character that Wang Li did not annotate, but Baxter did, then add a little annotation saying Wang Li consider it didn't rhyme. Mm. And so what we get here is we say, okay, so for the Tsui and the Hui, we add an annotation like, oh, this is B and this is C, just to say they are not part of the original, original uh, annotation. And what we get is this graph here. Uh, so now it has the same nodes as uh, the one from Baxter, but as we see, it has fewer uh, edges, right? Um, feel free to interrupt if something is not clear. So now that we have these two graphs, well, we can compute B-cube metrics. Um, for recall, we get zero. Uh, I need to mention the direction. I consider Baxter correct here and Wang Li to be the evaluated one. And so uh, Wang Li only identified 0 0.5 uh, of, the, of the things that rhyme. And Wang Li, every time Wang Li identified two things as rhyming, Baxter agreed. So that's a, zero, uh, that's a 1 0 precision. And when we do the harmonic mean, we get 0 0.66666. All right. Um, it seems that all is good. Um, but what if I add a third annotator? So now let's pretend like there's this guy. Uh, he speaks uh, Mandarin and he says, but where it, like there's this way character at the top there. And clearly here we have like this uh, sway, tue, hue, blah, 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 lay. So probably way is also part of the rhyme. So, uh, and let's pretend that person is, is me. Um, so I add an a, a uh, there in front of way and say, yeah, it's part of the rhyme. And this is, this is the graph for that third annotator where everything rhymes. Now we need to align Baxter. So we add a B in front of way and we need to align Wang Li. So we add the D in front of way, right? That's the same principle as uh, in the previous poem. Nothing has changed so far. Now, if we compute the scores, um, okay, so we get a score of the third annotator against Baxter or against Wong. This is, these are all right. Uh, these values don't matter. But this, we can recompute the score between uh, Wang Li and Baxter, and we get 0 0.73. But two slides ago, I told you that the score between Wang and Baxter was 0 0.667. So now, just by introducing a third annotator and saying, oh, I need to realign Baxter and Wang Li, uh, the score has changed. Although, of course, these two publications of Wang, of Wang and Baxter have not, have not ch changed themselves. Uh, it's purely my computation. And <clears throat> this, I think, is the problem with uh, B cube metrics, um, is that it means now that, for instance, uh, the paper by uh, Liszt, Kill, and Foster uh, says Baxter and Wong agree 97% of the time. If I bring a third annotator, I'm going to bring to push that score between Wong and Baxter up. Um, anytime you add more annotations, the score go up. So one thing we could be doing is say, so it, it means you can't compare results across time unless you recompute everything. And so every published result gets obsolete as new results are published. Uh, and you can only compare results by saying, OK, take all everything that has been published in the past and compute the new set of annotations. That's possible, but OK, that presumes you, you have the, the values and you can't quote old numbers. That's a bit problematic. Right. Uh, one thing we could do is we say, OK, we're going to always annotate every single character of every poem, because then that's stable. You report the, the number twice, and it doesn't matter if I add other annotators. Uh, we will always get the same scores. But unfortunately, well, so it is possible to do this, but every time you 
add these sort of like dummy annotations, the scores goes up. Uh, because now you say, oh yeah, Wong and Baxter for these first character, they agreed that they don't rhyme, so uh, that pushes the score up. And now if I do this, for instance, Baxter and Wong on this poem, it's not 0666 or 073, but it's 091. And even if I compare Baxter versus an annotator that says nothing rhymes, you get a score of 085. So the maximum is one. So as you can see, we get results that are a bit difficult to interpret. We don't know, like, is 085 good? Well, I've just shown no, because someone who says nothing rhyming this poem is 085 compared to uh, what we consider to be the truth. So that kind of means, and this is unavoidable, I think, uh, with B-metrics. And the, re the reason for this is that um, rhyme judgment is edge based on a graph. It is not node based. And B cube metrics measure things based on nodes rather than relationship between nodes. So any sort of metric that is node based will have this problem. Uh, you can eliminate an entire class of, of metrics if you consider, like me, that this is an issue. Um, I've added some graphs here. Like the two graphs above and the two graphs below express the same judgment of like what rhymes and doesn't, but they just look different. And the fact that these graphs look different but express the same thing really tells us we should be looking at the edges. Like these extra nodes that we see here, they're playing, they have no role. So the way I solve this is just to say, I'm not going to look at nodes. I'm going to look at the edges of the graph, which don't change based on, you know, if you add any other annotator, it doesn't change the edges of previous publications. You, you only add new nodes in the graph, but these nodes are alone. So it is, it is fine. Um, and then the metric that I propose is extremely simple is, okay, let's use precision and recall and F1 like we did before. But instead of doing it in that B cubed way on uh, nodes, we just do it on edges. So we say, um, okay, Wang said this character and that character rhyme. Do we find it in Baxter? Yes or no? And vice versa. And that means, you know, it's not dependent on alignment. So it doesn't matter if you have Wang, Baxter, and a third annotator or not. Uh, you can compare more than two annotators, and you can compare results that have been published. Uh, so if you have a ground truth and you say, let's say Baxter is the ground truth here always, uh, you would say one gave this number and this third annotator had this score, then you can say which of the two annotator is better uh, instead of having these like abstract numbers that are not interpretable. Um, and that means published results remain valid across time, which I guess is a uh, a desirable property of this. Uh, the const is that, uh, as you see in this sort of graph, every time you add a new node, you add a, a lot of edges, not just one edge. And so, um, in fact, uh, the number of edges is a quadratic function of the, of the number of nodes in the cluster. And that means that your score is going to be like highly influenced by big clusters. So if you have a very long poem that you've annotated very well, that's going to do a lot more good than annotating badly 10 other poems that are small. Um, and, or if you have a poem where there's like 10 lines with the same rhyme and then the two last line with a different rhyme, getting this wrong is not going to matter. But I think it's acceptable. First, I don't think we can really avoid it uh, if we agree that we should annotate edges and not nodes. Um, but also, it is more difficult to annotate long poems, so maybe we should reward this. Um, you know, I think people can propose other, other metrics that would be better, but I, I don't think these cons, maybe a cons, can be, can be avoided. Right. So now that I've talked about the metric, I'm going to use it. Um, so I mentioned I published this uh, annotation of the Chuan Pang Shi and the Chuan Feng Shi. And 
I wanted to say, well, now I have a metric, like is what I published good? And uh, Ash presented earlier that, so I have three different annotators. So one that says everything always rhymes, one that says, let me check in the Guang Yun, does it rhyme or not, and annotate this way. And the last one that says, my annotator, uh, who kind of has read a lot of poetry and is able to make better decision, um, these are the three annotators. And I classify on, do these three annotators agree? Do they all disagree? Or is there one of the three that disagrees? Um, and we see in the corpus, basically community, is rarely the odd one out, um, 0 0.4. Well, there's only 300 poem out of 250,000 where community doesn't doesn't agree with either Guang Yun or um, or naive, and naive agrees with Guang Yun. Um, and so I, yeah, where am I going? Yes, since I can't really check the ground truth on 250,000 poems, the idea is. Let's sample some of these poems. So I took like a sample of a bit over 400 poems. I went annotated them by hand. Uh, I took some poems of all of the categories that we see here. Um, and then I compute the score on that sample rather than on the entire uh, corpus. Um, then you can try to compute whether it's stati statistically significant. I had done the computation. It's not presented here. And basically the, bound, the bars, uh, error bars were very small. Uh, they were so small that I was basically writing some like plus zero zero, and I was okay, I'm just not going to write it. Um, it took me around two and a half hour to annotate uh, these 400 poems. So yeah, I guess annotating uh, 5,000 plus poems um, is more doable at least than doing 250,000 poems. And very interestingly, so the way I do it here is. I do the sample and then I annotate it with my uh, algorithm and I said now I correct the annotation so that I save time, you know, every time there's a poem that's just like a, a, uh, I, I just say, okay, I scroll and, you know, this took me two seconds instead of maybe 15. Um, and most of my time, so half of the time was spent on like the 20% hardest poems, which is nice because it means I spent my time correctly. Like things that was easy to annotate, I just visually look, okay, it looks fine. I move to the next one and then my time is spent on the stuff that is hard where the computer is less able to, uh, to do the job. Uh, and these categories kind of tell you uh, where you might want to spend your time should you wish to annotate the entire corpus. Right, so results. Um, I present precision, recall and F-score, but uh, uh, for the three annotator, uh, this is on the entire uh, sample of 400 poems. And what we see is that like the clear winner is always community. Community has very good recall. Uh, precision is very good. And the F score, ma the maximum value would be 1.0. So um, these are good results. Um, Unsurprisingly, the Guangyun doesn't do too badly on this kind of corpus because it's a corpus that was written kind of with the Guangyun as the background. Uh, and we see that when the Guangyun says these two things rhyme, it's almost always correct. In fact, it's as correct as when the, the community. It's just that the Guangyun misses a lot of the, of the rhymes. So things that poets used as rhyming, the Guangyun will say like, no, no, you can't use these two things in the poem. Uh, they don't rhyme. Um, the fact that we get very good precision, but not that good recall means there were a lot of merges and not very many splits. Uh, if you had splits, then your precision would also uh, go down. Uh, so we have this good number and right, if we, we can still maybe break it down by uh, inter-annotator agreement as I was showing. Um, and these are the three annotators and we see that basically almost everywhere community annotator is the best annotator. So when all of the <laughs> poems agree, okay, well, it's when Naive disagrees, that means community and Guangyun agree, then they have the same score. Uh, when the Guangyun disagrees, it doesn't seem to matter. Like the community is just uh, almost perfect. And it's only when community annotator disagrees with the other two that it's like less good. Um, and I think Nathan was asking earlier, like, if the three annotators disagree, like, so what? 
but it seems like community is still the best uh, choice you have. 0 0.77 is not a great F1 score, but you know. So the conclusion here is like, all right, what I published uh, earlier is usable. Um, yeah. Um, and based on these scores, you could, you could even say, well, okay, I know some areas where it looks like it's bad. So I could just go and try to hand annotate the ones where it's bad if I wanted to have a better thing, you know? Like when they all agree, we've seen, or when the Guangyu disagrees, we see, oh, the F1 score is almost perfect. So don't waste your time annotating those 25% and 63% of the corpus. You can just go and like in priority annotate those like 6.5% and then maybe those 5.1%. Um, and of course you can annotate these like 300 poems that are here. So we've already reduced the space of like what you need to annotate by hand uh, should we want to. Uh, that still takes like maybe a couple, uh, well, 80 hours, I think I have computed to annotate the rest. I'm not going to do it, but uh, you know, that's that's more manageable than than you know 600 hours. Um, right. So that's a quick recap, and then after a little game. But um, so we have a, met a metric. Um, there might be better alternatives. I propose that we use the one I present here, but I'm very open to someone saying there's something better. Um, and we have two data sets. The one I published before now is kind of validated, like hey, it's good enough, like you can use it uh, for whatever you want to be doing, like historical phonology, stylistics, you know, analysis of rhyme patterns, etc. Um, and I've also published the sample that's hand annotated. So anyone can come and like write their own annotation and compare against this. Um, and, and right, apart from this, I have a little quiz. Wow, that is dense. Can you date this poem? So we have three columns that represent uh, early Middle Chinese, late Middle Chinese, and early Mandarin. Well, I know that early Mandarin is a bit problematic, uh, given that maybe the poet is not from a Mandarin area. Um, but uh, the annotations uh, you see, so like those D, A, B, etc. This is what my annotator produced. This is not what I believe. I believe this poem rhymes all the way through. It's a, 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 a uh, on the two columns, but my annotator was not able to, uh, to pick that up. So of these three columns, which one do you think re best represents the period of this poem, if you can read? Yeah, that should be readable. Really all right, who thinks it's uh, early Middle Chinese? Okay, who thinks, yeah, who thinks it's late Middle Chinese? A few more hands. And who thinks it's early Mandarin? I have the answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the correct is late Middle Chinese. Uh, the poet is called uh, Lu Zhen and is from like the uh, tens, late 10th century uh, from Hunan. Um, what you can see is in this column, everything has the vowel a, uh, sometimes a instead of a, but if you look at the first, uh, during the early Middle Chinese period, this poem would have read uh, variously a, 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 um, wa, this kind of thing. It doesn't really rhyme consistently. And in early Mandarin, we have some a, a, uh, ye, yue, etc. So the only column where it kind of consistently rhymes and has the same vowel throughout is uh, late Middle Chinese, which corresponds with the dates of this poet. Um, so I quite like this. And the fact that the fact that the annotator is not able to pick that up is because it looks at the entire corpus from like the beginning of the tongue to the end of the song, and it makes a general model of this instead of like being able to say, oh, at the time of that poet, this is how people would have rhymed. Um, and okay, same exercise. Now you can try to guess the period and maybe make a comment on where this poem, this poet might have been coming from. So here again, this is my annotator, which is wrong on this poem. And I think this poem rhymes throughout. So everything should be rhyming.
let you read a few more seconds and then all right we think this is an early middle chinese era composition I see no hand. Late Middle Chinese. Early Mandarin. All right, so 100% of the hands that were raised were on early Middle Chinese. That is perfect precision. Um, yes, this is a poet uh, from the 11th and 12th century. I don't know what time the poem was composed, but, uh, and can you guess like roughly where it would have been coming from, like north, south. Yay, indeed, it is a northern poet uh, because we see that we have a very early loss of the codas, the K and T at the end. Um, so in early middle Chinese, this, this didn't rhyme at all. We had some like Ike, it, ache, etc. Uh, when the when the K dropped, uh, if it was K with a with an open vowel, sorry, with a front vowel, I think, uh, it gave rise to a year, uh, and, and then that year assimilated with uh, the vowel and basically left an E. Uh, and we get the same, uh, as for the T, it just dropped, and it just happens that everything here is it, so once you drop the T, you get E. Um, there's this interesting character, which has like a fairly rare pronunciation where it has a T in like some, note of the like Tindian Shouen uh, that says, hey, there's a pronunciation in the in the Mengzi way. It has this pronunciation with a T and this matches like semantically exactly this line. So like you can confirm like here it was meant to be pronounced as a T uh, if the poet, if the poem had been written uh, at, at the time. So maybe the poet kind of knew, oh, there's a T here and I'm trying to make things rhyme with a T, but my own dialect you know, he was trying, I think, um, he didn't make just things rhyme, or oh, everything has to rhyme in E, but, or, or U, maybe, I don't know, uh, early Mandarin pronunciation, but he had a sort of awareness, oh, that's a Ruxiang accent. Um, I don't know where he would have get, gotten this awareness. Um, yes? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not, uh, I didn't dig, but I think so. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's a late development. Anyone can call me out on this. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but anyway, I think this is an interesting poem, like that you can see the poem and you can say, well, based on this, clearly it could not have been an early Middle Chinese because it's K, Kata, Kata, Kata. And we see that in early Mandarin, suddenly everything resolves very nicely. Aside from the tone, I will leave someone asked a question about tone rhyming. There were rules, of course, in the Tang and Song poetry, but there's also a lot of like poets who will ignore this or like discard uh, the question. Um, so let me know your questions or comments. Yeah, you could do this with all languages, but uh, the reason we do this for Chinese is that where well, we don't have the alphabetic spelling to tell us what characters are pronounced, so we are less in a need, I think, for others. Uh, but that's that's still a relevant uh, thing. Like the one of the paper I quote earlier, where I said, "Oh, they only look at where the words rhyme, but not in the context of poems." They could do it in the context of poems. They look at rhymes in like early modern German. I think they do uh, up to twentieth century. Having an absence of a rhyme in the edge, the edge, yeah, to a node where we expect there to be a rhyme relationship versus to a node where it's just random, right? There isn't an expectation of rhyme. Mm -hmm. It means something different. Right? Yeah, that, that's an okay. absence that is meaningful in a way that there are nodes where an absence of an edge wouldn't be meaningful at all. Um, and, and like, is how do we can we take that into account? Is that taken into account by only focusing on edges or? So I'm not like sure mess, right? where do you base your expectation on? You say there's no node where we expect there to be one. Maybe yeah, that's- Yeah, exactly. Well, we're just thinking about like the, I know you don't want to say naive, but like the naive end of here, right? Like there's a certain, there's logic there to say, okay, we expect, you know, line end A, line end A. Yeah. The fact that 
you know, maybe there isn't it's line in A, line in no A yeah. is more meaningful than everything in the line being no A, no A, no A, no A. No A yeah. Right. Hmm. I am not sure how to answer this. <laughs> <That's not laughs> I don't know if I even framed it right. It just seems like, you know, maybe it's the precision tool, like a precision of agreement. Yeah. In terms of there is a random relationship is fine, but also, you know, agreement and when there should be a random, but there isn't something different. From. Yeah. yeah. I think these you would have. So my method is really, is really trying to address the challenge of annotating these very large amounts of data that we have. And then you can say, now I have some specific questions to ask. I can do like some corpus uh, queries on it. Uh, and there you could do the yeah, absence of something that I expect. But you already start with the hypothesis of I expect to find uh, to find this. Um, May I intervene here? Because I, I think that in a way, um, you already deal with this. Uh, so we're talking about the BQ metric, which Julian ends up not using, right? But already there, like uh, like like your intuition is, if two people disagree about a character that's in right position, it means something different than if one of them thinks there's like lying internal rhyme and one of them doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. But this is sort of actually captured exactly by the adding nodes in, because you would only add nodes in when someone has proposed that those are relevant positions. So there's there's no, you know, it's 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 only the the maximal hypothesis where you're saying you know all characters are relevant that this criticism really, you know, or that this point really uh, affects yeah, because yeah. because otherwise it's like yeah. Baxter did think those positions were yeah. relevant. Yeah. Mm. There's, uh, sorry, it's not really part of the question anymore, but I noticed that back, both Baxter and Wang Li, they annotate the stanzas of the shooting. They don't annotate the poem. And if you look at the very first poem, you know, like Guan Zhu, you have like these like Guan Guan Zhu Jiu, Zai He Zhe Zhou, and then you go like two stanzas below, and it's again like Yo Zhou, and these are, set, are like annotated as different graphs in these. And, I feel surely the fact that in this poem we have like two stanzas that have, well, Mandarin O there. Why don't they take it as positive evidence for rhyming? They just assume, okay, like across stanzas can't rhyme. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not your, that's just the point I wanted to bring up at some point. Um, I have just a trivial question. Why did PQ call that? B cube is called this because the authors of the B cube paper are called Baga, Baldwin, and they are the friend called uh, something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. 